It's my pleasure to welcome Amit Akut, the artist uh, of Artist Making Music. So Amit, welcome uh, to our conversation. It's really such an honor to um, include you as part of the triennial and to be able to premiere this exciting new work um, in partnership with Proto Cinema. So I would love to just start the conversation to ask you to expand a little bit about um, your thoughts on the development of this particular work. Um, and, you know, why thinking about artists, visual artists making music? What was the idea behind that? First of all, um, thank you, uh, Michelle, for the invitation and commissioning this piece together with Proto Cinema, together with Mary. And uh, we had the idea of a concert first before everything happened. Uh, and uh, I didn't want to reduce the idea, you know, when, when we knew it was not going to be a live performance, live concert with, with my ongoing uh, collaboration with my uh, friend uh, Maru uh, Subotnik. Uh, we were planning to do this live concert to transform it into something else that is not uh, a reduction, that is not compromise, but that's actually can be under the conditions that we, we are right now, uh, can be even... Uh, how we can maximize the results uh, instead of compromise is achieve something that is that anyway uh, needed to be done. And this film needed to be done at some point. I just wanted to instead, uh, knowing that instead of uh, the live concert we could do, we could have this also in such a short period of time, actually. And it was kind of a miracle uh, the moment I took the decision, you know, I thought I'm not going to do any compromise, but actually get this film ready for this premiere. And I'm really happy that it's ready. Uh, contacting all the artists, not knowing who will give the permission as well. And now arriving to this uh, moment and uh, have this article film uh, about the subject, uh, I'm quite uh, happy that we are able to uh, premiere it today. And the idea started uh, with the first lockdown last year. Mm -hmm. So when I was stuck during my travels, you know, I, I was uh, on my way to, way to do a solo show. And then on the way back, I couldn't return to Germany. Uh, and I ended up in Istanbul one month and where I was planning to stay only two days and another month in Amsterdam where I was not planning to go. So during that period, I was uh, using uh, my time as productive as possible, you know, when everyone had to sit at home. And uh, I started with, uh, with the first uh, in the series, the first documentary, it became a documentary as well. But initially they were not supposed to be documentaries. They were just going back to the research and the ideas and inspiration I had over, you know, 13 years, 15 years uh, since the beginning of like, since my studies, basically, uh, beginning of my practice, which were the artworks that inspired me, but under the given conditions, which was like while sitting at home. So I start thinking about artists making works at home, what kind of works they did at home, not only throughout the pandemic, but over the, uh, over the uh, last five decades. And it's the same after that, uh, thinking through that and thinking of like over hundreds references, they were inspirational to me, realized that I'm still very much inspired by the art world, the artworks uh, of the last five decades and even before, especially the recent past. And there has been a lot of artworks that has been inspirational that they were just making my brain somewhere uh, stored, but uh, rethinking about them, they became fresh, they became new and they became inspirational as well. Not only for me, but everyone around me, you know, from cross generations. And then uh, first collecting this material and the second chapter was artists making music as uh, first one artists making works at home. And, and then after I continued with art and TV and art and fashion. So I was thinking of all these uh, cross sections between, you know, sometimes artists, sometimes designers, sometimes uh, musicians uh, or, you know, in, in directors uh, and uh, in, in appearing and disappearing in different mediums. So it was interesting to see that all those references somehow naturally came in under those categories. I could have come up with more categories, but by the time it two months was over and I decided, okay, I can go on with this forever, but let's move to the next, uh, next step, uh, which was, uh, let's do, let's be more articulate. Uh, let's take it more like an essay. 
uh, when we have all these random references under specific categories, what does it mean? What kind of research there is there already that is done? Uh, you know, academic research or art historical research. And uh, there are those researches. And there are some surprises as well. So there are some usual suspects uh, that we all know. They, they, they work in this intersection between different disciplines of art and culture and, uh, and so on. Uh, but there are also a lot of surprises. So I was happy to combine uh, in between generations and also surprises with usual suspects and really think overall idea together. Fabulous. Well, let's just take um, as a focus for a minute, um, you know, this commission that you created for the triennial, Artists Making Music. You know, you've said that you have, this has been, you know, a culmination of maybe decades long thinking and passion for this uh, kind of creative process. And I wonder what it is about kind of both this, this conflation of visual and oral art practices that really um, is compelling to you or that you feel is has a special synergy to it um, that you bring to this documentary? Well, um, you know, when I studied uh, visual arts, I was always, always on the visual sides of things. So I have visual memory, uh, visual conceptual ideas. So everything came with visual background and sound was missing over 10 years. Until my show uh, in uh, Van Abbe Museum, that was uh, my mid-career work uh, exhibition uh, in 2015, mm -hmm. I decided to focus on something missing that was sound. You know, even uh, in uh, video works or um, installations and performances, where was sound for 10 years? It was always uh, on the site somewhere. But there was never any attention, uh, like I was not paying attention much because I was a very visual thinker. And at that moment, uh, we added a guided tour to the exhibition. And that was my uh, also uh, very much the beginning of my first musical collaboration with Fino Blandox in London. We did small uh, performances, musical performances at ICA and other places. Uh, later, that became almost like a band. And we did concerts in, in, uh, in Venice with Creative Time and in uh, Chisenheim Gallery in London uh, and Wanabe Museum. So we actually used stage cons concert platforms to give the concerts or public platforms. Mm -hmm. And I collaborated with professional musicians as well. Uh, and it was an adventure to, you know, the sudden shift from there to there. Then I continued with my friend Ali Demorel later, uh, who is also a VJ and uh, his partner, Barbara. Uh, we did uh, performances with Savi for Documenta uh, as well, uh, events. And uh, later uh, with Maru, uh, we had five concerts and we had planned concerts, including this one, uh, as Swatnik. So uh, the, with Maru, the, ser the, the adventure became, you know, uh, even if there's a, there was not much change, the chance lately to give live concerts, and we had plans to go a few places. We did one in Casa at Fredersiano, uh, and uh, that was really good to have that festival location just before COVID, I mean, a few months before things started. Um, but it was very useful uh, practice to have it on the site because of the presence of sound. So every time I, ed I edit a video, I edit a film, uh, there's always sound research is happening. You know, if we, even if you do jamming or rehearsing, uh, coming up with ideas, we don't use at that moment, it's always useful for the later occasion. So it's always there present. So it's not only about that moment of concert, but it's also about, you know, how it circulated as a soundtrack, as, an, as a memory and, you know, as a piece of sound uh, together with the visual visuals out there. And do you see then your practice as very seamless between these mediums or do you still see yourself more as a visual artist or a performance artist or a musician? You know, how do you um, structure your practice? Uh, is it very organic in that way? Um, well, my practice is idea based. So even, you know, as a musician, you can have uh, different positions like a composer uh, and you can have a music musical sound memory and ideas that's mostly based on sound. And I was trying to transform my ideas that are usually 
first appearing visual into sound ideas. So not with the professional knowledge. I wouldn't call myself a professional musician at all, but uh, in collaboration with others, that's possible to think with sound. So that's, this has been my learning process to think with sound and uh, come up with those ideas. So it's still an idea-based practice. Sometimes it appears as sound, sometimes it appears as an installation or performance uh, or conceptual piece. Uh, but idea is always there and it's discovered uh, sometimes during the process, but it's, it is the reason everything happens so i was also curious why other artists are interested in that so it was really good to go back to the book by Jörg heiser which is a very important reference and only reference is specifically written about uh, double lives you know of artists who are musicians sometimes more famous as musicians sometimes more famous as visual artists or conceptual artists uh, never worked uh, something else than language, but did collaborate with rock bands and, you know, like art and language collaboration that is in the film uh, or uh, Tim Gordon, that it's, it's hard to say just she's just a visual artist or she's a musician, she's a conceptualist who can uh, really effectively work with sound and visuals and image and performance in many different ways. And so s some artists are really like... Uh, uh, inclusive of all the mediums and they are in the center of it. So we see all these different examples in the film and also with the theory of your Kaiser defining why this context shifting is happening. Right. Why artists need that. Yeah. And, you know, through the, through this film that we just saw, you know, you are proposing to look through the 20th century at how artists are using sound as a medium, right, in their practices. And I wonder, you know, because there are so many different ways that artists can incorporate sound into their practices and there's so many different artists, you know, how, what was your criteria in terms of the artists that you selected and, um, you know, the perspective that you were trying to, um, to share with our audience um, through that selection? Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of missing parts. Of course, uh, it was very organic. It uh, depends who I could to get in touch directly uh, from cross generations who, you know, it was very beautiful surprise to hear back from art and language within 24 hours, you know, the, in, in considering how fast they check their emails. So you would never know who you could reach in such short time, maybe sometimes an advantage to have the short time, but it was also the beauty that uh, to get those permissions from very different versions, like different types of artists from different generations uh, working with different genres of music. So there's no like one type of genre. And uh, and that, that makes the film richer, you know, to, to have all these very different kind of examples from different times. And it could have been added a lot more, you know, there are a lot more other artists could have been in the film. There's no end to it, of course, but I like that open-ended approach and also this organic relationship among the artists with the trust and, you know, really sharing and uh, because these are anyway those type of artists, they are open to expand their practices and they're open to the ideas like that. You know, uh, they, they, they understand right away why a, a film like that must be made. It could have been someone else making it also, you know. Uh, I, I, I just purely enjoyed thinking of some of the surprises for people that they, they had no idea those artists had that kind of ongoing practice together with usual suspects. So, and also from which part of the world. So not only focusing on Western canonization around this as well. So I tried to take a most diverse uh, perspective onto this as possible but still a very subjective one because it's also who I could reach out in a certain amount of time. But this kind of uh, works and uh, are very dynamic and organic. Uh, so I would imagine myself doing the same thing in 10 years. It would be probably some other story. Uh, and, and looking at them like this, there's, as I said, your Kaiser really uh, study, ex did extensive study around this. And uh, he talks about, you know, uh, uh, four basic models. You know, you, one is adaptation of the medium. One is context shifting from one art form to another one. Uh, one is uh, having a double life. 
and one is mixing means of media from different art forms you know so uh, this is how he approached and it could be different categories as well but this kind of clarify all this really diverse approaches by the artist but most important is that why they needed this uh, and he also explains you know that to to really uh, deal with the contradictions in one field so if you always remain in one field uh, you, you you have this big challenge about uh, how to deal with those contradictions but when you are not professionally or sometimes semi-professionally enter the, another field like taking such risks uh, you actually have a better space to deal with contradictions of a very much professionalized uh, field sometimes knowing a lot about one field limits your actions in order to deal with the contradictions so he explains that in detail and very well uh, in his research. And I think uh, looking at the examples, there's there's these deep uh, reasons why artists desires and keep doing it. And I think it's very refreshing for also going back to their very professionalized fields. Mm -hmm. Sure. I mean, and I think one point that really stood out to me um, during the course of watching the film is, you know, this perspective of visual art being equated with high art and music with mass culture and kind of that dichotomy between the two. And I wonder if you could talk about that a little bit in terms of, um, are you thinking about more of a mass audience and the reception and accessibility? Um, or is it kind of thinking about how we receive information visually or, you know, more organically through audio um, channels? You know, I guess maybe if we can flesh that out a little bit in terms of that disparity between high culture and high art and mass culture and kind of how, how that fits in with the artists and, and the types of ideas that you're playing with in the film. Yeah, both mass culture and high art, they're very different things, but they have their own contradictions and problems. So high art has very limited amount of audience. Uh, it doesn't reach out mass masses. Uh, so it's hard to think it as commons. Uh, uh, on the other hand, uh, mass culture is something very easy access and looks like it reaches out to big, big groups of uh, audience that visual arts or conceptual arts or contemporary art can never reach, uh, you know, in the in, in, in immediate environment. Uh, maybe in the long run it can, uh, but it's very different uh, effectiveness. And this can also be different, you know, uh, thinking of TV having a central tool or uh, YouTube or internet or other tools now, you know, in, in new generations, how it has been used, like how you can actually reach out to bigger audience. But as soon as you shift the field, you absolutely reach out a different audience and we need to reach out different audience we need to reach out to an audience that they have no clue how well known somebody is in another field but they just pay attention and focus on what has been done and this is this is really important for an artist not to not to get stuck in their comfort zone in that sense that you know once you're established in one field that every, you get certain kind of acceptance they wrote, right uh, you can just repeat yourself you you don't even need good ideas anymore you're just accepted in a certain way and when you just go to another field you, you could be just a beginner or an like intern in that field and that's kind of empowering uh, to to for an artist to really push their capacity and their uh, their ability to reach other kind of audience and understand that i think those surprises are important to understand ourselves, where our work and our practice is standing, not only in a historical context, not only in a long-term context, but in immediate context, and especially to, in response to crisis. So, uh, you know, we, I thought I will leave my comfort zone, give a concert, live concert, which is kind of leaving out of my comfort zone, and then the whole world changed, you know, and now... We are back to, but it's also still not the comfort zone that I am used to. So I have to be responsive instead of thinking it as a compromise and think of like what could be an extensive research uh, response uh, to that that doesn't feel like a compromise, that I will be proud of it after five years or 10 years that, 
oh, it was good I did that at that moment because maybe in another time it would take a lot more time or you know uh, I wouldn't be able to focus as much and things like that. So it is very important not to think those limited, uh, unexpected situations, those moments like now we live in this kind of world uh, as a compromise moment. It is actually, it could be an emancipation and empowerment moment for what we could do. Mm-hmm. No, that I love that way of thinking about it. It's very expansive and open. I mean, and I wonder if, you know, you had also mentioned an element of these practices, these interdisciplinary practices or cross-disciplinary practices being reflections of a social critique. And I wonder if then kind of what you were just elaborating on that, you know, seeing this as more of an opportunity rather than, you know, being out of your comfort zone, if that is a social, you know, a critique on how people, you know, are living their lives in this very kind of prescribed and maybe very, um, small way instead of thinking of things more opportunistically or just more expansively in terms of um, being open and um... yeah I mean uh, the labels are sometimes useful sometimes useless so uh, I can give you an example uh, for instance in Turkey there used to be good to call yourself academic and now actually it's easier to if you want to travel it's easier to call yourself as artist so before artists were not taken serious, but actually it is not. Uh, it is the it's the it is a type of job to do. Before academics were very much taken. Now being an academic is something more dangerous, but you can call yourself artist. So it's very interesting how these positions are shifting and understanding and conception. Why all of a sudden being an academic could be a dangerous title before it was just an appreciated and respected position, but it is very politicized. All of a sudden being an artist, which was always had been politicized, but it needs different kind of audience. And somehow it could be the the position that gives you more freedom to travel or uh, act and do your action and even in a, a give your political message. So we can just shift between these labels and titles or be a musician uh, when when it's the right time to do so. Not when it's the most comfortable thing to do so, to call yourself an artist. Like I'm totally against that, calling myself an artist. Or when everybody expects me to call myself an artist, which doesn't do anything radical or anything add anything to myself also to expand my uh, limits and capacities so it could be used when it is necessary and could be labeled so uh, it it should be uh, time sensitive Uh, it should be crisis sensitive uh, how we call ourselves and how we act upon Hmm. no very good point and I guess then that brings me to my next question because as you alluded to in the beginning you know the creation of this commission for the triennial was a bit under duress, right? Because we had envisioned a whole different um, platform for you that it would be a live interactive performance that you would come to New York. And then, you know, we had to pivot because of the pandemic. And I wonder um, through this process, you know, and, and you were saying under lockdown that it made you really think about ideas and, and artists and, you know, modes of creation that you had been thinking about over you know, a number of years and really kind of then allowed you the time and space to bring it together in some cohesive um, form, right, through these, through these documentaries. And I wonder, going forward, will this shape the trajectory of your practice, um, you know, for future projects? Uh, Or have you, have you been inspired to create other projects based on this um, experience and this period? I mean, I, I, I still appreciate uh, the presence of Sportnik. Uh, we, we did this little soundtrack uh, that goes with the film and, uh, and you know, it didn't completely disappear. It found its way naturally within it. And in the future, it will appear. It's exciting to do completely, and if you, of course, uh, time to time. But it's also exciting to remember what has been our inspirations. So right now, since there was more time to reflect, I mean, when I work over 10 years, that was the moment I, I remember in 2015, uh, when I was asked complete new commissions, I responded that, okay, instead of a new commission, let's invite everyone I collaborated in the past that come from non-art backgrounds. 
So all of a sudden in London, we had this project, uh, over 10 people coming, traveling all around the world. One is a fireman and the other is a lawyer. One is a deep reader. One is a mixologist. They all travel from uh, Finland, from Netherlands, from Turkey to come and meet a hairdresser from Germany, travel to London, who I had collaborated maybe once, maybe a few times, and somebody from past. But it didn't feel like past. It didn't feel like a solo show either. It felt like a group show with people, nobody was artist. But this look back thing was not necessary because I saw it was too fast, everything happening, that there's not enough time to look back what has happened. This is as important as a new exciting things coming up, absolutely. And there's a chance uh, and a condition for that. Again, uh, I would like to continue with that direction. Always when there's a moment to slow down and look back what has happened and rethink and reformulate it in a new format. And I think this uh, self-reflective uh, cross-referential practice is, has been happening in many artists' practice. And that's why I also get all the support from the other artists and I really appreciate sometimes not even knowing each other personally, they, they support the idea you know, inclusion of their work in somebody else's work in such a generous and special uh, approach to that. And I'm also always open to that myself when another artist approach. No, that's fabulous. I mean, and I think that you really embody this idea of collaboration, I think both, you know, with Maru, with Subotnik, but also I think in your dialogue, you know, evinced by um, your selection in the documentary and the way that you're, you know, showcasing these artists' practices. And I think the very generous way in, in which they allowed you to use the footage, I mean, is such a beautifully collaborative way to work and, you know, really paying homage and having a dialogue, you know, it, in different ways. I think it's really thoughtful and very um, innovative way to, to dialogue with your peers and, and to really kind of look back at the history and, and see how things have shifted and evolved over time and, and how they sit in the future. Because I think contextualizing that, you know, especially in some of the older works, like from Art and Language from 78, or even with Leibach, who you start with in 96, you know, such a different time. And so kind of, you know, at the time that it's made and looking at it in retrospect, thinking about the passage of time, thinking about the, pa you know, the kind of accumulation of experience um, and of uh, contextualization, I think, it really brings all those to the fore in a very thoughtful and sensitive way. And I think it's so beautifully done, so. Thank you. Yeah, no, definitely. We're so thrilled to have this uh, possibility to, to work with you and to share your perspective with our audiences. Um, you know, I wonder if there's anything that you would like to leave our um, viewers with about either this particular the ideas that you put forth in, in this film or in your larger practice, I would love to give you the opportunity to, to share some, some last thoughts with our, our I mean, I would love to see uh, sooner or later our viewers, uh, what they compose of their references. And when they, when life has been slowed down lately, you know, this year and uh, how they look back, uh, all the inspirations they had. Uh, I also talk about this with the students when I teach. It's always a nice surprise and a pleasure to discover the existing things, but as new things. Wonderful. Well, it's mm -hmm. such a pleasure to have you with us today. Thank you so much for your collaboration on behalf of the Asia Society Museum. I look forward to future partnerships ahead. And uh, thank you again for your time, Amit. Same for me. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> Soon. <laughs> Wonderful.